God bless each and every one of you. It's a privilege to talk to you again today. As we approach the presentation of evidence, part three, we're going to discuss the issue of the common salvation. In Jude verse three, Jude writes, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. In the Greek, it reads this way. When I wrote to you about our common salvation, it was necessary for me to urge you to put up a stiff fight for the faith once for all time delivered to the saints. Once for all time delivered to the saints. Jude believed in the common salvation. We all know that salvation is totally unique. It is glorious and it's personal. But salvation is something that all Christians have in common. In every church, in every generation, since it all began. The plan of salvation has not changed since the apostles preached it to the early church. There is not a different plan of salvation for different groups of people living in different ages. There's only one plan of salvation. It was sufficient in the beginning and it's still sufficient today. In the New Testament, the term salvation describes two essential components of the Christian life. Simply put, it is being delivered from the penalty of sin, which is eternal death. And then you are given the gift of eternal life so you can live eternally. As Paul said in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So the only way to receive the gift of eternal life is through Jesus Christ our Lord and Him alone. Receiving the gift of eternal life is a life-changing experience from the inside to the outside. The Protestant Reformation of the 16th century was guided by the conviction that the church of their day had drifted away from the essential and original teachings of the apostles, especially in regards to what it was teaching about salvation. I quote one former Catholic priest. He described it in these words. For over 1,200 years, the doctrines of grace were hidden from the people by Roman Catholicism. The church had taken the Bibles away from the people. The common people had no way of knowing the truth according to the Holy Scriptures. During the Council of Trent in 1545 through 1563, which was held in three different gatherings, in those councils, they placed the Bible on the list of forbidden books. If you were a Roman Catholic at that time and you wanted your sins forgiven, you had to give your Bible over to the Catholic Church in order for the priest to forgive you of your sins. That is why that historical time period was called the Dark Ages. At that time, the Catholic Church taught that you were saved in this way. Number one, grace plus merits. Number two, faith plus works. Number three, Christ plus other mediators. Number four, scripture plus tradition. And number five, to the glory of God and Mary and to the saints, unquote. The truth of the common salvation was completely misrepresented. Then God raised up reformers 
in the Reformation who restored the truth of the common salvation as it was clearly taught in the Bible. Through biblical conviction, they proclaimed the fundamental essentials of salvation by grace in five different ways. These five different ways were called the five solas of the Reformation. The five solas are five Latin phrases or slogans that emerged during the Reformation. And so without using the Latin words for the five solas, these are what they are. Number one, we are saved by grace alone. Number two, through faith alone. Number three, in Christ alone. Number four, according to the scriptures alone. And number five, for the glory of God alone. Very, very powerful. With fire and holy passion, the reformers earnestly contended for the faith which was once for all time delivered unto the saints. The understanding of the common salvation through the five solas exploded in the hearts of living saints. Christians actually experienced the reality of true salvation without having to first go through purgatory to become worthy enough to get to heaven. We all know the story of Martin Luther nailing 95 theses of opposition to the door of the Catholic Church in Wittenberg, Germany. I've been there. It's a very touching place. And he did it because God had revealed to him the truth of the five solas and all about the revelation of salvation by grace, by faith. Any religious movement in its teachings that leads their followers away from the common salvation by faith in the person and work of Christ alone is leading those people astray. These words are taken from Rome's La Savita Catholica, and I'm reading them to show you the emphasis that a religious movement can put in a man. And there's damaging effects that follow those type of of, of, of extreme emphasis towards any one individual. I quote, It is not enough for the people only to know that the Pope is the head of the church. They must also understand that their own faith and religious life flow from Him. That in Him is the bond which unites Catholics to one another, and the power which strengthens, and the light which guides them, that he is the dispenser of spiritual graces, the giver of benefits of religion, the upholder of justice, and the protector of the oppressed. Similar words have been said about Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormon Church, and Reverend Moon, as well as other religious leaders. This kind of thinking has even found its way into the message movement towards William Branham, as well as other men in the movement. And it came because of statements like this being said about William Branham. And even William Branham made some of these statements himself. The Elijah of this day is the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we turn around and say that William Branham was the Elijah of this day. Or some will say the message and the messenger are one. And then turn around and preach that the message is Jesus Christ. Therefore making William Branham Jesus Christ to the people. And then there are others that make statements like this. William Branham fulfilled all the fivefold ministry and only his voice, because his voice is the voice of God, and only his message on tapes 
will perfect the bride alone. Or the only job for ministers today is that they must point the people to William Branham. It is no wonder that we see people praying to William Branham, praying in his name as the new name of God, bowing to his pictures, baptizing in his name. Others make William Branham their infallible absolute. And some even make him their infallible interpreter. Replacing the Holy Spirit, replacing the Holy Scriptures by William Branham. It's very sad. But the Apostle Paul refuted this kind of thinking in these scriptures that I will quote. 1 Corinthians 1, 12 through 13. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? And then in 1 Corinthians 3, verses 3 through 7. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Eternal life is not knowing Joseph Smith, Reverend Moon, William Branham, or any other man. Eternal life is knowing Jesus Christ personally. Knowing who He is and what He'd done for you 2,000 years ago. The Apostle Paul preached Christ as the source of eternal life and not Himself. A true God-called man will always point the people to Jesus Christ alone. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 5, For we preach not ourselves. This is Paul speaking. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord. So every true servant of God will preach Jesus Christ. He will not preach a man or some apostle but he will preach Christ. But Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. As we know, Jesus Christ is the only way to God. Jesus Christ is the only source of truth. And Jesus Christ is the only source of eternal life. In St. John 17 and 3, Jesus said, And this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. St. John 14 and 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And then we read in St. John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word, and believeth on him that sent me, hath, not going to have, but hath, present tense, everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation or into the judgment, but is passed from death unto life. No Christian is under obligation when they're winning souls to introduce the people to any other man other than Jesus Christ. We have a real problem when ministers teach 
that if a Christian is only trusting in the blood of Jesus that was shed 2,000 years ago, then you are still lost. Or the reason they say that is because they teach that God has given to us a new atonement, a new token, a new bleeding word. And if you're going to be saved today, you have to identify your faith with that message or you will perish. What that is doing is when those type of teachings are projected, and they are being projected, and they have been projected for many years, that is actually adding another plan of salvation to the original plan. It is actually preaching another gospel message. And we know that God is against that. And what that does, it actually destroys the faith of the people in the common salvation, which is actually the only way that they can be saved. The common salvation is not changed. It is the same today as when the apostles preached it. So I want to re emphasize this. There is not a new atonement today and there is not a new Calvary that has produced a bleeding word that can do more for you today than what the blood of Jesus Christ has already done for you 2,000 years ago. When those type of things are taught, that is actually demeaning and belittling the effects of Calvary. It is it is taking away from the power of the blood of Jesus Christ and what it has done for you through redemption. In Hebrews 10, 14, Paul says, For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. There's not going to be multiple offerings or multiple sacrifices or multiple atonements. All of that was taken care of many, many years ago on an old hill that we call Mount Calvary. The blood of Jesus Christ is good enough for time and eternity and no new blood is needed. As for me, and I hope it'll be the same for you, I'm going to cling to the old rugged cross and I'm going to exchange it someday for a crown. I love these scriptures that shows how we are complete in Him in Colossians 2, verses 9 and 10. For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in Him. In other words, nothing else needs to be added. And ye are complete in Him, which is the head of all principality and power. Also in 2 Peter 1, verses 2 and 3. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him, not through the knowledge of a religious leader or a religious movement, but through the knowledge of Him, all things that pertain unto life and godliness is given to you. Through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. The jury must face the issue on the common salvation. The people need to know how to be saved. They need to be taught to put their faith in the finished work of Calvary. That the true gospel that was preached by the apostles is good enough and sufficient to be saved. Now I will deal with the issue of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The teaching, as we hear around the message churches, that you cannot receive the Holy Ghost today unless you come to William Branham or his message on tapes. That is totally unscriptural. 
It is baseless in the Word of God. All you need to do to receive the Holy Ghost according to the Scripture is to believe the Gospel and obey Acts 2.38. I quote Acts 2.38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. <clears throat> and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Or you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Jews had to accept the very person they had rejected and crucified at Calvary. They had to turn away from all of their unbelief that they had held towards Jesus Christ. And then they had to put their genuine faith in Him and in His work of the death, burial, and resurrection. See, that is true salvation. And, and, and that is the result of true repentance. See, after you repent, which means to turn away from all unbelief and believe the gospel, you then get baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Your sins are gone. And the promise of the Holy Ghost is yours. It's simple. God's plan is not changed. And no one should try to change it. You receive the Holy Ghost today the same way Peter instructed the Jews to receive it in Acts 2.38. Christians have been saved. And I want you to pay close attention. This is very, very, very important. Christians have been saved and filled with the Holy Ghost throughout history without following any exclusive message, message or messenger for their day. Smith Wigglesworth is an example of this. God changed his life and filled him with the Holy Ghost when he placed his faith in Christ and Christ alone. Smith Wigglesworth did not read the books of any other men. He did not even read the newspaper. The only book he read was the Bible. And he won hundreds of thousands of souls to Christ. He had supernatural miracles of every sort without number. The dead were raised to life again through great acts of faith. Missing limbs were restored on human bodies by his commands of faith. The theme song for his healing services was only belief. God spoke to him every day. He had multiple gifts, even the gift of discernment. He revealed the names of an entire family living overseas that he had never met before while he was praying for their father who had come to the USA. I will deviate from my notes just a moment to say that when he was praying for this father, he told the father that he had uh, that the name of his fourth child was such and such. And the father says, no, that's incorrect. I don't have uh, a fourth child. I've only got three children. And he says, no, he said, you have four children and this is the name of your last child. And so the father tried to respond again and say, no, I don't have it. And Smith Wigglesworth said, look, sir, he said, your wife was pregnant when you left. She's had a baby and it was a boy and this is his name. Now just listen to me because God is speaking to you. How could anyone, anyone, Tell a servant of God like that, that it was entirely impossible for him to be born again and be filled with the Holy Ghost without first accepting an exclusive messenger or message of someone other than what the scripture was able to give to him. The only messenger he followed was Jesus Christ. He was led by the Spirit of Christ and he demonstrated the power of Christ. Charles Finney, Charles Price, Amy Simple, Simple McPherson, F.F. F. Bosworth, William Seymour, 
Raymond T. Ritchie, and a host of others, all received Christ and were filled with the Holy Ghost when unnamed servants of God preached the simple common gospel to them out of only one book, the Bible, in the power of the Holy Ghost. They took that Bible and they brought it to life. They showed the reality of what a living Savior was. And those sinners and those people that were listening to them believed, converted, and was filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. To intimidate people by telling them they are cut off from the blood of Jesus by not following William Branham is absurd and it's cultish. In St. John 10, 27 through 29, Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give to them, unto them, eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. A Christian is a follower of Christ. I say this under Bible authority. No child of God can be cut off from the blood of Jesus Christ when their genuine faith is in the finished work of Calvary. We are not saved one day and then lost the next just because we disagree with someone else's theology about the importance of who William Branham is. He is not our Savior. His blood was not shed for us. And neither is He resurrected and seated by our Heavenly Father in heaven as the Lord of all. We are saved and filled with the Holy Ghost by putting our faith in Jesus Christ and His work and obeying His word. God gives to each of His children the full assurance of salvation that takes away all fear of condemnation. And no man, I want to say it again, no man, no preacher, no religious movement, no organization, can take that blessed assurance away. In Romans 8.16, Paul said, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That's personal. That's between that individual and God. So I encourage you today, those of you who are listening in this jury trial, don't let anyone rob you from the joy of your salvation through Christ alone. The baptism of the Holy Ghost is an individual Bible experience between you and Christ. I encourage everyone to put your genuine faith in Christ and His redeeming work. Obey Acts 2.38. You'll receive the Holy Ghost. And also, you're going to sit down one day to eat and drink at the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven. And I say, I can't wait to see you there because it's going to be real wonderful. It's going to be glorious. This jury must face the issue of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. It's serious. Your faith must be in Christ and Christ alone. Believe the gospel. Obey the word, receive ye the Holy Ghost. God bless you.